a little bit later. Um, so thank you, welcome. Um, we're here to talk about um, the 2018 vintage and I've been you know, very well aware, I don't want to bore the people who've come and done processions before by repeating all the stuff about who we are and where we're from. So we're not gonna do that on the basis of most of you are up to speed on that. But I did have a little bit of a look at my photographs and my records of the vintage from you know, the beginning of the year when, um, uh, when the year started uh, all the way through the year. And I, I've gone and taken some pictures of vines and flowers and things like that that happened through the vineyard year. So I'm going to try and talk you through the vineyard year and then talk you through what happened at harvest and then um, uh, talk you through how we made the wine and how it's turned out. Why are you smiling, Amanda? Well, because I keep, I'm like a ghost. I said, let's turn the background off because it's a bit distracting. <laughs> Uh, it's so peculiar i can see myself disappearing and yet i'm here all the time sorry that's very dull look you need to admit only until oh, I do, yes, sorry. Do, 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 do. okay well, we're back to normal background now that's so hopefully amanda won't keep disappearing <laughs> i've also turned a slightly distracting light on so i turn it off for a bit a bit dark maybe we aren't i don't know do you feel the light off it's a bit interrogative let's try that yeah um Good. Okay, so I've provided quite a few pictures for you, one or two videos, and I, you know, hope you'll indulge me and um, that you enjoy the chance to get a bit of a snapshot of how the year went for us before we taste the wine. Obviously, you're welcome to dip in and have a little taste as you go along. Um, no, nothing to stop you. And also, do please chip in with a question or a comment as we go. Um, Welcome, Jessica. I hope you can hear us. Uh, She's nice. only just connecting. Yeah. Me. Nice to see you and. Uh, Hello there, and um, I think we're all here now, so uh, we can we can crack on. Jessica, I was just saying that uh, we we may be able to unmute ourselves if you know if we want to have a chat. So please don't worry about muting. There's only if, I think there's only thirteen or fourteen of us on the call, so um, and Amanda can mute anyone whose keyboard noises are coming through. So um, do feel free to keep the, keep to keep the mute off and and, and chat away. Um, I was also just saying that we're going to talk through a few slides that I produced. Um, because I hope, I hope it's interesting in some way. So let me start doing that. And um, we might do 20 minutes of chatting and uh, talking through slides before we get onto the tasting. So sip away if you're a bit thirsty. Uh, and I'm going to share my screen. So here we go. PowerPoint. Da, 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 da. Well, she nearly ended the call there. That Did would I? have been funny. <laughs> um, no, I can't remember how to navigate the screen. That's very annoying. Why don't I do that? Da, 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 da. Yeah. Is it annoying? It must, must be an easy way to move the screen along for us. Try areas, those ones. No. no. no it's, it's annoying. Okay, I'm just going to go and stop the share for a moment and make sure I can do yeah. it that way. That's fine. Okay, let's go back. Uh, sorry, folks. Um, zoom, start screen sharing again. Oh, you might have to do it like that. Can you all see that? Yeah. yeah, okay, well, if I have to drive it this way, I will. I'm gonna just go back into the presentation mode and see if I can, yes, I can do it now, so splendid. Right, um, I'm really sorry I'm going to bombard you with data at this point. Um, You're gonna say uh, next slide, Justin. Can have the next slide, please. You don't wanna see this? Well, no, can, are you gonna say, can we have the next slide, please? <laughs> <laughs> well, what I'm showing you is three years of weather data, and um, we are, there's a weather station not too far, it's in Totova, which is about 15 kilometres away, but um, this is the max and min temperature and the rainfall over three separate years. So the I year we're talking about 2018 is the middle year. Um, and if I draw drive my mouse around, yes, the sort of the winter is here, um, the middle of the summer is here, and then the next winter is here. So this is the year in question, 2018, and this is the rainfall in the year in question. So I'll just draw your attention to a few things. Uh, oh, it's, not uh, it's not doing it again, where's that? How annoying. Uh, it rains in summer, basically. Uh, well, it, it normally rains in the winter and a bit in the spring, and then it kind of stops raining in the summer. Um, and I'm just going to get exit from this. You have to do it on the... Do, 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 do. It should work that way. Um, so what are you doing? Oh, you can go there. No, don't do that. Yes, you do. You want to show the screen. Yes, I do. Marital argument going on here. <laughs> okay, so I hope you can see that part of the screen. And uh, this really is annoying. Why is it doing that? Click on that and see if it ch changes it. Yeah, that's how you want to do it. Okay, so right here you can see the graph. Uh, you may not see it so much, so much detail. The first thing to point out is that winter temperature was really quite cold. 
And you've you only got a couple of years to compare against. You can see a bit of minus in this year and a tiny bit of minus in that year, but not that was so the, the winter of 2018 going on 2019. It wasn't very cold. 2019 going on 20 was quite cold in, the, um, in November. But this year we had several times where it was quite considerably below zero. And that's really good for the vines. They like cold weather. Um, but it does mean that they start a little bit later because you've got some really cold weather into late February, which is pretty late for us. Um, so the, some growers had a little bit of bud burst or, or, or the vine starting to grow before the frost, the last frost came. So there's a little tiny bit of frost damage in, in this year. Um, then what you've got is, this is the period of sort of April, May into June. And it's quite uncharacteristically cool. The temperature here is 20 to 20 to 30. So we're in the mid 20s here. Um, often at that time of year, it gets a bit warmer. And crucially, going down to this bit, it was really quite wet during that period. So we've had a lot of rain in the, in the winter, regular and relatively um, large amounts, particularly in this period here in, um, in early April. And then continuing rain through April and May. But what you can see then is the beginning of, um, well, actually mid-June, uh, it stops, I think it was mid-May actually, it stops being uh, wet and you barely get any rain all summer. So this summer particularly was a lot drier than a typical summer. So last summer there's a lot more um, peaks of, of rainfall during the summer. This was uh, three periods of rain but lots of periods where it was very very dry. Um, and it was sort of consistently hot through that period as well. Not much cold temperature, not very very hot. You can see you got the 42 in 2019 here but 2018 was all between 30 and 40 or 30 25 and 40 which is quite normal summer temperatures and very little rain but you can also see enormous rainfall um, around the time of harvest and we'll talk about that in a little bit so that's a kind of picture of the, vi the, the vintage conditions uh, let's move to uh, a, a photograph of bud burst so this is a little bit after bud burst so the, what happens is the little um, the little spur here has got two buds on it one here and one there and they just start to swell and the first time they open is called bud burst and this is a maybe a week or 10 days on from bud burst where they started to form baby leaves and started to grow and that's the beginning of the um the the, the cycle uh, and so that was actually slightly late in in mid early mid april often starts to happen in late march in an earlier year um we then had flowering which is this process here these are little baby flowers and the little tiny white things are the flowers the little brown things are the caps on the flowers that fall off. The flower then comes out and then from the flower develops a little um, bunch of grapes. And I'll show you something in a minute which might be interesting. So this is April, May, June and this is during that flowering process. We have got some rain and often you, you're a little bit worried by rain during flowering. But in this time it wasn't particularly windy so we actually had reasonably good flowering for us. And that's really crucial for how many grapes we got. Um, I'm going to show you a video here. This is a flower and this is, we have this problem in our part of the world, particularly with our old vine Grenache, which is called, um, in French, it's called coulure, uh, and the English word for that is shatter. And it's uh, something that happens to a bunch of grapes when it forms, and then the grapes don't form properly and they just fall off. And this is a regular problem for us, particularly with our old vine Grenache. It's why our yields are so low. And if I start playing this video, I'm just going to um, zoom through it a bit to where I put my hand underneath it. And then I, you can start tapping the, um, the bunch and the little flowers and grapes just fall off. Very distressing this. Uh, I, I get very upset when I watch this kind of thing because it means money just dropping away. <laughs> you know, less and less bottles of Domain of the Bee can be made every, every time one of these little grapes falls off. It's happening all over the vineyard, all the old vine grenache. Uh, to one extent or another, it are, are losing grapes because of shatter. Um, you can see some of the grapes here, these grapes will be all right because they've formed and they're starting to grow and swell. These grapes up here will be fine, but the little ones that haven't quite made it yet are just dropping off at this point. So you'll end up with a very sketchy bunch which has lost 60% of its grapes and you'll end up with a lower yield. Why do they do that? It's just a thing that old vine grass is susceptible to. Um, other varieties not at all. Um, it's a particular problem and, and younger clones of Grenache have been bred to be um, not susceptible to, to shatter. But anyway, that's probably enough of that. Um, then the little grapes start to form into little pea-sized bullets and they grow and swell and then um, some weeks later there's the process called veraison and that is the change of colour from um, a white grape, or a green coloured grape, to a black grape. Um, and this, this photograph was taken on the 29th of July. Again it's not an instant process, it takes two or three weeks from the start to the finish of veraison um, and 
one by one, the grapes on a bunch turn. A, a typical bunch might go in, in, in a week, but some bunches start earlier and, and later than others. And um, it is quite worth uh, just sharing at this point that all um, grapes natively are actually black grapes. They, they're, they're born, grapes were originally all black and the white grapes that we eat and the white varieties of wine that we drink from the white grapes are mutations or selectively bred white only versions of those grapes. And the reason is that grapes originally would have been bred to um, have birds eat them and then disperse the seeds. That's how wild plants propagate. Um, and there's no good being a green grape hiding in a green canopy because the bird can't see you. So all fruit changes colour when it's ripe. And that's the signal to the, the species that are required to disperse it, that it's ready to eat. Um, so all grapes naturally would turn black. It makes them much easier to spot in the, when they're hanging uh, on the vine. And the, grape, the birds would come along and eat them and disperse their seeds. And now we've re realised that some grapes mutate and don't develop that black colour. And we've decided those grapes have a particular characteristic that we like for making white wine so we've kind of chosen to to work with them um, but that's you know, I, I find it quite interesting so there are certain varieties like pinot where the pinot blanc the pinot gris and the pinot noir are pretty much genetically identical they just have the mutation that means they change color or not or partially change color and grenache is the same it's got a, a red a pink and a white version of the same grape they're essentially the same grape but they have this uh, mutational difference. And I think when you said we have done this, what you mean is humankind. Humankind. Humankind not, has done Not it. Justin and me. Yes, <laughs> yes, we haven't been around that long, um, nor been farming grapes for that long. So um, you probably remember this summer because we had a pretty amazing summer ourselves. Uh, this is a photograph. So you know, we don't spend the whole time in France, I have to confess. Uh, we, we live in London and we go out quite frequently, but uh, here we were in Richmond Park in uh, August. And it, it kind of looked like the Serengeti. The, the grass all grew very nicely in the wet spring and then it all just dried. And we had an incredible summer for English grape growing. It was really warm and dry, lovely weather and consistently long periods of nice dry weather, not too much rain, but enough rain just to keep things going along. Um, but yes, it, you can see Richard Park was very, very brown that year. Um, and so our harvest is normally mid to late September into mid to, mid, uh, early to mid October. We knew this year was going to be a little on the late side because the flowering was late. And I keep in regular touch um, with the guys in France and I sometimes pop out for a few days just to have a look at things in mid-September. Um, on this occasion, we actually drove out on the 25th of September. I just happened to find this in my photographs. This is the, the way we drive, cross over on the tunnel and just drive all the way down through central France. Um, I took uh, the dog with me and Amanda came out a little bit later on for a couple of weekends um, and this is what we we're looking at for the forecast. So time of year, late September, you drive out to the 25th, this weather forecast is the 29th of September. You can see it's uh, nice and sunny, some windy days, 23, 24 degrees, a little bit of rain periodically, but not much to, to worry about at this point. Um, and that, out I go, hope in my heart. Um, <laughs> the first thing I do is tour around all the vineyards, check how the grapes are, do samples. We'll talk about the samples in a minute. Um, if any of you are geekily interested in this kind of stuff, um, partly to keep myself amused and partly to justify the enormous amount of uh, time I'm spending in France, I, I decide to do some videos as we go along and post them. Uh, you can see they're extraordinarily successful, uh, <laughs> up to 100 views of some of them. Um, but obviously that, that's building as more people discover them. Um, so this is a kind of complete picture of the 2018 harvest. Uh, that are helpfully numbered in rough order uh, if you want to go and have a look at some of them they're kind of two three minutes long mostly sometimes shorter just giving you a, an illustration done you know very just by me on my phone very badly sometimes you can't hear me because of the wind um, so I'm really overselling it but if you if you if you're interested <laughs> pop to YouTube and just look up Domain of the Bee and you should be able to find the channel and, and subscribe if you're if you want to have a look at a few um, but yeah first um, job is go around sampling um, so to tell whether the vineyard is ripe, you taste the grapes and um, you know, that tells you quite a lot. Um, but you also need to measure the sugar level, crucially, because that defines the final alcohol and also the acid levels in the grapes. So you, you want to be tracking them quite carefully. Acidity, as grapes ripen, um, the sugar level goes slowly up and the acid level comes slowly down. And there's a kind of ideal level of both. And if you're lucky, you get that spot on at the same time when the alcohol reaches 14 and a half and the acid is just right, they're ready to pick. If they also combine with tasting really good and having lovely ripe tannins in the skin, you're lucky because that's a year where everything's come together and you pick 
and you can then get the harvesters to pick the next day. That's, that's how you determine how to pick. In reality, uh, it's never quite as perfect as that, and it's not absolutely certain that you can get the harvesters to come and pick. I work with my friend John Mark. He's got um, 20 or 30 vineyard blocks to pick over the course of a harvest, and he has to send his teams here and there and everywhere. So I have to liaise quite carefully with him to say, I think we're going to pick next week. How about Tuesday? Um, and hope that Tuesday's okay. And he might go, can't do Tuesday, maybe Thursday. And then I have to sort of negotiate with him about how, uh, how we're able to do that. Um, so this is, I think, Amanda and I, I think you came out by this stage. Um, and this is our Coombe de Wa plot. You can see lots of, this is quite interesting, because there's lots of white and pink grapes mixed in. And this is because it's a really old vineyard plot where every vine is different. Most of them are Grenache, the Sun Carignan, and then there's Grenache Gris, which is this pink coloured grape. Uh, Grenache Blanc, which is this coloured grape. And that could be a Grenache Blanc, or it could be a Macabre, or one of the sometimes slightly paler coloured um, grapes. So quite a mixture, as you can see, from these two plots. Uh, actually one plot, but we've picked two, two separate bits of it. Um, moving on, so harvest dates. Uh, we picked the first block on the, 20, uh, the, second, sorry, the 2nd of October, the next one on the 8th, and the last one on the 11th. Um, and I'll show you the kind of weather that was around at the time. Um, this was the morning of the uh, 2nd, beautiful day, quite cold. I've looked at the photographs and everyone's wearing woolly hats and puffer jackets. So I think it was sort of one of those nights that was sort of 8 or 10 degrees. So when you come into the vineyard first thing at dawn and the sun comes up, it's pretty chilly. By mid-afternoon, it was, it was fine. Um, and we blitzed through this vineyard and picked about two and a half tonnes of grapes, which was good, a good yield for us. Um, there are some of the lovely grapes that we picked. Um, you can see in this vineyard, there's mostly carrots. Justin, uh, forgive course. me. What's the altitude of these vineyards? Uh, good question. So um, Maury itself is around 150 mm. metres. Uh, and all our vineyards are slightly up the hill from Maury, so uh, 180, 170, 180, that kind of area. Um, nothing much higher. There are vineyards in the valley that are sort of close to 300. And then there's a few little plateau, um, actually quite near our house uh, and further up the valley, where you might get uh, vineyards at 400 or 450 metres. But yeah, most of the vineyards are between 150 and, and 300 in, in the Maury area. So not terrifically high, um, but high enough that they're quite considerably later ripening than the vineyards on the plain around Perpignan, which had probably ripened two or three weeks beforehand. Um, they're hotter there, they're more exposed to the sun, they've got more, um, they've got, you know, more irrigation, they're more, they ripen earlier, they just start earlier and they finish earlier down there. So yeah, that's a load of grapes from La Roque. Um, I thought it might be fun to show you a video of uh, what happens in the cafe, which is a cafe is normally not the high point of social life. Well, it is the high point of social life in Maury, but there isn't much social life in Maury. <laughs> and normally you go there and there's two or three tables of people chatting and drinking and that's about it. This is the, mid the middle of harvest. I mean, uh, harvest starts in mid-September for most people. This is getting towards the end and the, the cafe is uh, as full as it ever gets. And these guys come from everywhere. So there's probably 40, 60, 50, 60 people in the cafe. That's Richard, who used to, I used to work with. And that gentleman is Bob, who doesn't want to be filmed. And there, uh, the Café de la Placette in Maury is uh, the hub of social life. When you want to have a beer after, after harvest, that's where you go. Um, and there's a lot of people from Eastern Europe, from Spain, um, English. There's, people, there's vineyard owners from different parts of the world uh, and from other parts of France. It's a very cosmopolitan crowd. And it's quite fun down the cafe overnight um, after you finish work. Um, so I thought you, that might give you a little illustration as to what life in Moori is like. Um, we're going to move on to the 8th of October. Still lovely weather, so all, all has been good so far. And we picked this back to Genève plot. Um, you can see in the distance there, that is the Chateau de Caribus up on the hill there. Moori is over here. Um, it's in the main valley of Moori, one of our loveliest Grenache blocks. Well, we only have three. <laughs> they have two plots, and one, two of them Grenache and one of them is Carignan. Um, and yeah, there we are picking on the 8th of October. What happened after that, though, was this. So the 8th of October was this day here. That's the 9th and that's the 10th, I think, which is quite a considerable amount of rain. You can't see the scale here, but you know, that's a lot of rain. And this, we will talk about a bit later on, is a record amount of rain. Most rain for, I think, 100 years they had in one, uh, effectively one night, which I think was the 15th. Um, so we luckily, we picked our 
Baxter Nerve plot the day before, and, and then it rained for two days, quite a, quite a bit. And we had the big decision, uh, do we pick immediately after the rain or do we wait? And we luckily decided, even though the grapes have all swollen a little bit with the water, slightly drop the alcohol level because as the sugar mounts up um, and the grape ripens and it loses moisture as it, as it dries and ripens, it gets more and more concentrated and more ripe. When it rains, it soaks a little bit more water up, which slightly dilutes the grapes, which means you have slightly lower alcohol levels. And so often when it rains, you think, well, actually, I'm going to leave it. If it's sunny and warm for three or four days after the rain, that'll dry everything back up again and shrivel the grape back down and make it more concentrated. And then you pick with lovely concentrated grapes. But we had a look at the forecast and we thought, actually, we don't really want to risk leaving this longer because we think it's going to rain again. So let's pick it the day after um, the last rainfall and, and cope with a slightly, uh, slightly more dilute fruit. And we can taste in a while whether we think that causes a problem or not, whether it's actually a good thing, um, if you know our, our range of wines. So this is the Coombe de Vineyard. And then I can, I can feel myself getting thirsty at this point, and I suspect you guys are too. So uh, let's keep this fairly quick. Uh, this is just the fact that we, we picked um, two and a half thousand litres from the, the uh, first block, 1,600. These are estimates at this point because you, you've got the wine in grape form rather than liquid form. Um, but I worked out we had the potential of about seven and a half, possibly to eight thousand bottles. Um, we also took a little bit of the juice out of the barrels that we thought were affected by the rain so that um, we left the skins with a bit less juice so we got a more concentrated flavour. But we put that juice into another barrel and fermented it as a sort of semi-rosé. We weren't sure what we were going to do with it and I'll tell you what we did with it later on. Um, the 13th was a harvest party. Um, this is not the cafe, this is another little restaurant and um, we kind of commandeered it for the evening, invited about 60 people. Um, they, all, I don't know, they, they, paid, they all paid 20 euros a head for a sort of fixed, a fixed meal. Like everyone brought bottles and, and had a really nice evening. So um, this is Amanda talking to Jean-Marc, who's our winemaking partner. And this is me pouring some wine for a couple of people I don't actually recognise. Not looking at what you're doing. No, well, I'm you know, obviously <laughs> too, too excited by the social media content of what's <laughs> happening. Um, so after the rain, past, uh, past our Coupe de Vineyard, and one of our vines has fallen off the edge. Um, we periodically take photographs of this vine next door to it, which we, who we've called Hector, and he perches gamely on the edge still, uh, but he will fall off sometime in the next five years probably because he's getting, you can see his roots being exposed, and this guy next to him fell off this year after the rain because uh, erosion caused a bit of land to slip away and he just, he just toppled over, um, and that is problematic uh, when you've got very old well, vines. Do you pull them back up and stake them back in, or do you... Um, I think this particular guy, no. I mean, one of the other problems is you can't really get to it to treat it because it's sort of teetering off the edge and um, it, there's little point. You might save a kilo or two of grapes every year if you manage to revive this particular vine, but um, you, you know, it'll take you a lot of effort to try for a couple more years to, to, to shore him up. So yeah, we, we haven't. We just only chopped him off and used him for a barbecue, which is very sad. Um, these are a few pictures. So I, I sent a newsletter out in uh, later October uh, just to say that our, our grapes are safely gathered in the harvest was, um, was done. But you know, broadcasting the fact there had been these awful floods right around us, it wasn't actually that bad. It was much worse further north. And there were villages that were... Um, Janice Robinson house was pretty much... The entire garden was flooded and just stopped lapping into the house. Uh, other, other villages lost their bridges and, and were you know, quite severely inundated. So it was quite a serious flood. Um, but yeah, a bit of winemaking. Um, grapes, when picked, uh, come into the winery, go through a destemmer where the stems get taken off uh, in most cases and then drop straight into a barrel. Um, here is a barrel in a cold container, which we move them into the cold container to get them chilled so that the grapes and the juice could get to know each other and start to extract colour without the fermentation taking place. We try and leave them in there for a week or so. Um, and then we bring them out and the juices look like this. Uh, that's a Carignan juice, always darker colour on Carignan. I think these are all Grenaches from small barrels. Um, some of them are very pale. That's from the Coupe d'Oie vineyard, which makes Le Genoux. Um, and one of these other barrels is also Coupe d'Oie, and I don't remember why one's a bit darker than the other one. But um, you can see it's naturally the juice is quite pale, even though it's been in the barrel for a, a little while. Um, and then we start doing this to the grapes. So this is the place where we make um, I'm just going to turn this volume down actually, I don't think it's very helpful. Um, this is the place where we, all our barrels are fermenting. You can see a lot of them in the background. This is a barrel full of whole bunch grapes. We didn't destem these. Um, 
as a result, the grapes are still sitting on their bunches. And when you try and push down, it's really hard because they're all matted together in a, in a raft. And you have to try and uh, push them down underneath because underneath is the bubbling wine starting to come through. This is very much just started fermenting and you can see the bubbles. Um, and every day you go down and you push your arm down, you know, almost to the armpit, pushing these grapes down underneath. Um, and every day they ferment more and every day they get more alcohol and more colour and more richness and less sugar. And um, you probably do this two or three times a day with each barrel. Um, and there you go, that's a bit what, of... What percentage would you... A couple of photographs. Uh, so this one we filled a little bit too full. So when it ferments, it brims up and some of the grapes fall off over the edge and you try and avoid filling it that full. Um, but here we are doing some punching down. Um, very geeky stuff here. Uh, specific gravity. So how dense the wine is, basically how much sugar's in it. You can see how long the fermentations take. So each of these lines is a separate barrel. You can see the ones we started earlier. We actually haven't started tracking them until the 9th of October. Um, uh, and then we started a whole lot of new barrels here. We took them out of the cold container and started them off and they, they warmed up and started fermenting. And then woof, once they started going, they really started going quickly. And they dropped sugar in you know, two or three days from nearly, nearly totally sweet to nearly totally dry. And then took a few more days to finish off. And then the temperatures involved with that are starting really quite cold around 10 degrees and moving up to 25 to 30 degrees, most of them finishing close to 30 which is a lovely temperature to ferment reds at. You get lovely colour extraction. You don't want to ferment too cold, otherwise you don't get the colour and the rich tannin and the flavours that come out with the warmer temperatures. Is the heat created by the fermentation process? Entirely by the fermentation process, yes. You don't heat them up at all. The yeasts naturally create heat as they ferment. If you have a very big tank, the temperatures can get to 35, 40 degrees on their own, and that's where you actually want to cool them down because that's too hot. Most people say 32, 33, 34 is as hot as you really want to get with the fermentation. So... Um, there we go. Now we're going to start tasting some wine in a minute. Just This is the pressing plan um, and I did this on 21st of October because I had to come back to the UK before we did the pressing. So these are the different barrels or, or cuvées. This is the Carignan and this is the Grenache. The Carignan have one, one big um, stainless steel tank which is 1200 litres or a bit more actually I think in this particular year. Um, and this is the plan of pressing that into a one 500 litre barrel, another 500 litre barrel and a 200 litre barrel of pressings was going to make mixed with the other Carignan pressings and made into a 500 litre barrel of pressings. This was just the plan, it didn't ever go completely according to plan. You can roughly see how we end up with each cuvee. We blend two barrels together here. So these two were from the um, Bac de Genève and these two were from the Coume de Wars. The Coume de Wars is the vineyard that Le Genoux comes from and if you follow these two fermentations through they were pressed together to make one barrel and a little bit of pressing wine. Um, and we are, the Genou wine is this barrel of 500 litres plus this barrel of 225 litres, which is effectively um, half of the, the pressing wine from each of the two um, Grenache plots. That, it's quite geeky. It is quite geeky, yeah. Because uh, Alison asked for this last time, if you remember. <laughs> I was strictly told last time, I want to see a flowchart of uh, which barrel goes into which wine. And we've got basically four wines being made from these barrels. Um, and we'll come on to that very shortly. That's pretty much it as far as the presentation stuff is going to go. So I'm going to just show you the wines that we produced in a number of bottles. We actually end up with a little bit more than I predicted, partly because we had a little bit of wine from a previous year that we used. We had one barrel of the wine that we, from the previous year that we blended in with Domain and V. And we also used a little bit of we, 200 and something litres of jean marcs wine to make up the blend of uh, the B-side. Um, end up with eight, eight and a half thousand bottles pretty much. Um, great, so there we are done on the presentation, and that took a bit longer than I expected. Sorry, I just realised that Jonathan uh, oh no. hasn't been able to join us for a while. He may be, he may have drifted off by now. Jonathan, hello, are you there? Well, he won't have connected yet. And he won't, he's there now, he's connected. Um, Jonathan, we were just doing a long presentation. I didn't notice you. He's still connecting. Okay, well, let's carry on and um, let's start tasting some wine. So, uh, we have actually got in front of us four different glasses with each wine, one wine in each. Now, you probably don't have that. So it will start with the B side, if that's OK. And uh, Jonathan, if you've just joined us, I'm really sorry we didn't spot you earlier. We were just doing a PowerPoint showing a few slides. And um, thank you for joining us now. And we're just about to start tasting. So you haven't missed the tasting part. And if you like, I can email you the, the stuff we were just looking at earlier. You can have a look through it in your own time. So... <laughs> I feel like I've been talking a long time. You have. Um, 
I'll just talk a little bit longer and then let's start having a bit of a dialogue. <laughs> um, so D Domain of the Bee is the main one we make every year. It's a blend of Grenache and Carignan. In the first few years, we just made Domain of the Bee. Um, we then realized that Les Genoux had a very specific and delicious character and we should bottle that separately. And in this particular year, 2018, um, I decided also that the Carignan component was uh, worthy of bottling on its own. So we decided to bottle a pure Carignan, um, the normal domain of the bee blend with probably slightly fewer barrels because some of them are being used for other things. Um, and then the B side, which is our, our lovely uh, second label, which we invented in 2014 when we thought our wine wasn't good enough to bottle as domain of the bee. We bottled it as a second label. Um, and it's subsequently become so popular that um, quite a lot of wine shops sell this and it works really well in a sort of hipster wine bar with a, a record label. So we're under a lot of pressure every year to produce more of this. So we take our lighter Grenache barrels and make this. And uh, the best, most concentrated barrels of Grenache and Carignan go into Domain of the Bee. So what this is, is pretty much 100% pure Grenache. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, it's tasting. You want to unmute? Uh, yeah, why don't we, if, uh, please unmute yourselves and chip in with some thoughts if, you, if you'd like to. Quite sweet, Justin, in a lovely, delicious, ripe way. Mm, thank you. So, so sweet in perception because of the relatively high alcohol. Um, this year we had some barrels that were lower than normal. We normally end up 14 and a half to 15 on most of our wines. The B side, I think, is 14 this year. Uh, yes. And yeah, 14 on the label. The actual okay. alcohol is just 14.1 just or something like that. Um, but so the alcohol and the Grenache grape can give you the perception of sweetness. It's pretty much bone dry in actual su measurable sugar level. It's you know less than certainly less than two grams per liter, um, which is you know barely barely perceptible as any sugar at all. And it's it's also barely fermentable. Um, you can't once the fermentation finishes, you you sometimes end up with a tiny bit of sugar that just won't finish fermenting. And if it's under two, it's quite nice, isn't it? So do you remember I told you about the rosé barrel that we put aside? Yeah. We didn't know what to do with it, and it wasn't very good rosé. It's quite dark and quite alcoholic, and you know you want a rosé to be refreshing. Um, but it actually, we decided in the end, had lovely, light, soft tannins. It, because it, if you if you take grape juice and uh, have it in contact with the skin, and then drain it off before there's much colour or tannin come out, there's very little tannin in that wine. So we had this wine then aging in a barrel. And we realised that actually with the B-side, we want to make a wine that is relatively low in tannin. And we make our, our Grenache barrels that go to the B-side, we, we macerate them less long, we macerate them less hard, so we have a softer, lighter style. And when we thought about the blend, we actually decided to blend in this barrel of what was effectively like a very pale red uh, into the B-side because we thought it, it really went nicely with uh, um, the rest of the wine. And it also brings a little, a little freshness and a bit of more acidity uh, to, nice. to the wine. So we're... We're pretty happy with this year's B-side. What do people think? <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Got some smiles and some thumbs up, which is good to see. Be nice chilled. It's also, I find really hard to get people to say what they think of a wine. It's just one wine. If you compare it to another wine, have it alongside, then you can say, oh, this one's a bit fruitier, this one's a bit richer or oakier. Uh, on which topic, um, the, the next wine we're going to taste and if you do have a second glass, it's quite nice be, to be able to be, pour the next wine into the second glass so you can put them side by side. Um, if anyone wants to rush off and do that, then that's probably not a bad plan. Um, you, you, you could have four glasses if you're really uber geeky and you want to sort of go between them, um, but there's no need for that at all. Uh, but it does help you just <laughs> nip back and compare. So when you tasted Les Genoux, you could go back and taste the B side if you have a little bit left in a glass um, and see, is it really worth spending... Thirty-five pounds on Le Genou when you can buy the B side for eighteen. You know, actually, if you're wine club members, which many of you are, then that would be twenty-eight and fourteen, effectively. So, is it twice twice as good? I ask myself that question quite often, and uh, I don't know that there is such a thing as a right answer. Well done, uh, Matt. Nice to see <laughs> extra glasses. So, the next wine we're planning to taste is the Carignan. Now, this comes from the La Roc plot, pure as a hectare of pure Carignan, and we had uh, I think five barrels. Um, also of Carignan from this year. Um, really bright, fruity, uh, forest fruit. Carignan's got much more of a kind of blackberry, um, uh, forest fruit kind of a character, and uh, um, sometimes a uh, 
Sometimes almost a black cherry character. Well, it's quite tannic. There's it? a bit, quite a bit more tannin. There's, Carignan always has a bit more acidity and sometimes quite a bit more tannin than Grenache. So that's what we're looking out for here. And I always thought this wine on the palate is quite a, a high level of oak. Right now, I'm not really noticing a particularly high level of oak. Um, all of these wines have got some, well, all of them are, are aged in oak barrels. Many of the barrels are four, five, six years old and give very little flavour. But every year we buy two or three new barrels. Um, so the Leisure New this year, the 500 litre barrel that it was uh, fermented and stored in was a brand new barrel, which has made it quite an oaky Leisure New. We often use a one-year-old barrel or a two-year-old barrel for Leisure New, but this year I thought it could stand a brand new one. There's always at least one brand new barrel in the, in the domain of the bee. Um, and I'm... I think this year we had. Doesn't matter. Yeah, I think we had three barrels. So I think there might be two barrels that went into the domain of the beer that were brand new. But the Carignan's <laughs> definitely got two, I think, one year old or two year old barrels in it. So there's a little bit of oak flavour. Um, we also, two years ago, we produced a cuvee of this wine, um, exactly the same, two barrels of our Carignan from La Roque. And I wasn't completely sure whether we should blend it in with the domain of the bee. And the reason I didn't want to is because it would have made the blend about 65% Carignan and the rest Grenache. And we normally have been around 50-50. I didn't want to take the main to be too far towards the Carignan style. So I just held out two barrels. I went to show them to um, the buyer at Oddbins, um, Anna, um, and she really, really liked it. Um, and they bought about 600 bottles from us. And so I thought, well, that's great. We'll have 600 bottles for ourselves and 600 bottles to sell to Oddbins. Um, and that, that was what gave me the confidence to bottle a Carignan on its own. Um, and it's possible that that similar thing may happen to this Carignan this year. We'll sell some of it and we'll sell some of it to someone else, possibly Old Bins, because uh, I believe they've just been pulled out of receivership or some of their shops have, and yeah. they're now trading properly again. So um, well, it's so good that they've carried on because yeah, so. they, uh, they, they, yeah, they've gone down to about 20 shops, I think, out from 45, but uh, it'd be great to see that they, they might carry on. So you could see this wine on the shelves of a local wine shop somewhere, um, but equally it's available from us and it's 22 pounds rather than 25, so it's a little bit less than the reg regular wine. And I think a lot of people have found it really interesting to be able to taste a pure Carignan when we've given the chance to taste a pure Grenache. So you've had one pure Grenache, the B side, one pure Carignan, um, and the next wine is Domain of the B, which is the bigger, richer, fuller flavoured and newer oak barrels of Grenache and Carignan. So you probably find it's got a slightly deeper colour, than what? Than the previous wines. Actually, yeah. it's probably close to the same close as the Carignan, Carignan, because the Carignan is quite a dark skin grape. Um, and this has got obviously Carignan and Grenache in it. Um, you may what's be looking to find a little bit more new oak. Ed, you got a question? Yeah, what's the percentage? Of, 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 what's the mix? Sorry, sorry, you've gone very quiet, that's why. Speak again. What's the mix of Carignan and uh, Grenache? I have, have to say, Ed, uh, I have defaulted to saying it's 50-50. In, years. in this case, I think it's about 51 point something and 48, 7 point something. But it's a bit of a fool's errand trying to be too specific about the exact blend because some of our Grenache vineyards have got Carignan grapes growing in them. And you're, you know, when you also press wine and you've got a barrel of press, you're not completely sure how much of each came from each barrel. You're guessing. So we are to some extent guessing in any, in any event. I think this is probably very slightly more Carignan than Grenache in this, in this year. We took out, so Le Genoux is primarily mostly Grenache and the B side is primarily mostly Grenache. Um, I, I think it's pretty close to 50-50 this one. You, could, you can go back, if you like, if you're uber geeky, you can go back to my um, slide that shows you which barrels went into, <laughs> which ones are pressed into which barrels and, um, uh, and that should give you a clue. And the, and the sort of average age of vines at this point with, with this particular wine? So we've got the three plots. Um, and the first plot that we bought, the one that produces Le Genoux, where we were told when we bought it was about 90, and that was 12 or so years ago. So well over 100. Um, the middle block that we bought, uh, it was about 60, 55, 60 when we, bought, when we bought it, so 65 plus now. And the last block was about 80, 85, we think. So um, it's very hard to tell because if you go before 1940, almost every vineyard that's marked uh, is a guess because when they started plotting the dates of the planting of the vineyard, they didn't have records, they had to go and ask people. And they used to go and say, well, do you remember this vineyard? And they go, oh yes, I remember my grandfather told me he saw it being planted. 
And so they sort of went, well, that must be about 1920. So they often guessed the date of the vineyard. And I believe that there's no vineyards recorded before 1909 or something. I forget, Katie Jones, or 1912, because everything that they couldn't remember, they just said 1912, let's call it that. Some of them are probably 1880s or, or 1900s, so the really oldest vineyards in the, in the area. But we don't think ours is older than the, um, the, the teens, um, sometime in the 1900s. Um, yeah, so this is effectively a blend of those three blocks, Ed, uh, and uh, we'll have mostly the Grenache from the Bac de Genève block, all the Carignan from the, the Laroc block, and there will be one or two barrels of the other block in, in this domain of the B wine. Um, Justin, uh, what, what's, what's the plan in terms of replacing the vines as they, as they drop off the edge of cliffs and do whatever they do? That's a terrifically good idea, a good question. Um, and the answer is, um, we are very consciously taking advantage of the fact that you can buy stupendously good old vineyards for very little money. And the cost of buying a new vineyard is a way, way cheaper than the cost of replanting an old, an old one. So when we are very much better capitalized than we are now and have a, a, a more thriving market around the world of people who, who need our wines and we buy more blocks, there will come a time when we start to say, well, let's, let's actually replant. We need some young vines in our, in our range. But not right now, if we were to grow, we'd probably be looking just to buy another vineyard um, and uh, accommodate the declining yield on some of these really, really old vineyards. In fact, the, the, the vineyard where the, the Genoux comes from, where that vine had toppled off, the yield is so low, it's almost totally uneconomic to farm it. And, and we only do because we produce Le Genoux from it. And we think that's really lovely and we'd be ashamed to, to get rid of it. Um, I have in my mind that, you know, I've got a couple of little tiny blocks that are not planted or we've ripped out some vines from and, and like a half a hectare. One day we might plant a half hectare of, of maybe even a white variety, Grenache Gris. Um, but I think in the meantime, because we're such a small producer, we can buy small plots that fulfill the requirement for, for younger vines and eventually we'll retire the Coombe de Wa plot. But the trouble is it's taken it 100 years to get to 100 years old. If we rip it out, then it's never gonna get to 120. So we may well just let it keep rolling on and maybe shrink it a bit to the most productive bit and, and take some of the outside vines away and, and try and look after the, what's left in the middle as a sort of heritage plot. Okay, so I'm aware that uh, we're kind of coming towards a uh, quarter two, so we've got some 15 minutes left, and um, haven't we haven't talked a huge amount about Domain of the Bee, but um, effectively these are all made in the same way, but we, to, in order to differentiate Les Genoux and the B-side, and to make some of the Grenache in a lighter style, we've started using a whole bunch fermentation, and Previously, we were basically looking for really rich, ripe grapes with very deep colour and destem all those grapes and then ferment, macerate for as long as we could to get as much colour as we could and ferment a really intense, strong flavoured wine that has a lot of tannin, a lot of alcohol, a lot of colour, and that's going to last a long time. And that's definitely what we like still to do for Domain of the Bees. So when we have plots that allow us to do that, we'll pick as late as we can and destem and have that style. But we do recognize that there's a, a scope for us to make a range of styles. And the, a lot of people uh, who are following Grenache, particularly as a great variety, are increasingly interested in a slightly paler, more delicate, more less sugary, less overripe, less, less uh, concentrated styles of Grenache. Um, parts of Northern Spain uh, grow wonderful old vine Grenache that you know, is quite pale in color and quite delicate and perfumed. And we certainly found that with our, our Genou vineyard, the, Genou, the, the plot from which Genou comes, occasionally it makes incredibly perfumed, delicate styles that are almost more like Pinot Noir than they are like, um, like Grenache. And so we're kind of almost trying to emphasize that with Le Genou. So we always take now some barrels and either the ones we picked a little bit earlier or ones that we've done a whole bunch of fermentation, um, that brings a bit of lightness, a bit of freshness and a bit of delicacy to the fermentation. Um, and then we, then we have the chance to play around and blend the ones that we want to, to make the wines that we want. So the Genou and the, the B side are both steering in this direction and the barrels that go into the, the domain of the B are a bit more concentrated. Uh, and if that's a summary, it's a bit like you're, you're almost like conducting an orchestra and you're sort of bringing in this and bringing that out. Every year you have the chance to, you know, a whole lot of different circumstances. You've got to make decisions to try and create the wines you want to create. And, 
you can intend to do something and then find the results are a little bit different from what you intended. So you set off with something in your mind, what you're trying to do, then you, you, you modify that as you go along. And then when you finish, you taste what you've done and you go, well, yeah, kind of half achieved what we did, but actually it's something different here. So um, I'm, I'm gonna go in this direction with that barrel. And then you decide which, which wood to put them in and how long to age them for and all those kind of things. So, um, you know, I, I, I don't pretend that there is a, uh, I don't think there should be um, a plan that says you know exactly what you're going to do before you start. Um, I think that way makes for slightly boring wine or predictable wine. And I think it's quite good to have an open mind and let the wine tell you what it wants to do to some extent. I hope that's a sort of semi answer to your question. It probably also says something about my winemaking style. I can see Ed looking very skeptical. Ed is a fellow master of wine and he also <laughs> makes very, very lovely Grenache in, uh, in Spain and a, a number of other things. And um, yeah, Ed, do you, what's your view on deciding to make a certain style at the outset or following your nose? Well, interesting your point there about the, um, the whole bunch fermentation. The, um, uh, Bruce Jack, who I work with in Spain, he's the winemaker. Um, he puts 20% of Grenache that we've done for a sort of premium wine, which would be probably the same level as the B, um, through malolactic, uh, sorry, um, uh, carbonic maceration. Yep. And, and that gives that sort of freshness and fruitiness, which I, I think is so distinctive in the Genu. I've, I've, I'm afraid I've moved on to the Genu, which is just glorious. And the Pinot Noir comparison is uh, spot on. It's, there's definitely that sort of almost sort of animal character and, and, and uh, that lovely kind of almost, you know, the strawberry syrup or the, the red berries and all that that you get from really good old Grenache. Mm. And Northern Spain and Roussillon, where you are, are not, I mean, they're just two sides of the same coin. They are. We're, we are very much Pyrenean. Uh, yeah. Grenache and Carignan are both Pyrenean grapes, uh, either from actually both originally from the southern side of the Pyrenees, from the, the Spanish side. But um, where we are in the Roussillon, it's very much the sort of Spanish influence, the Catalan influence part of, uh, um, of France. That's so uh, the, I think this year, the Genou, um, the alcohol level is uncharacteristically low. I think we said 13 and a half on the label. I think it might even be 13.3 in reality, which is really unusual for us. We're normally 14.5, possibly even 15 uh, for most of our, our reds. Part of that is the dilution from the rain. Can't get away from that. It would have been another degree higher if it hadn't rained before the vintage. Um, part of it is also the whole bunch. So we've taken, in fact, you can see that, uh, that slide. I won't go back to it, but um, the GE bit means grappontier, which means whole bunch. So from the same vineyard, we've had some Grappontier barrels and some Distend barrels. And we've taken uh, some of the fruit, exactly the same fruit effectively, and left the bunches whole and other fruit where we've Distend. And we've done that to see the difference. And this particular year, we did that from one of the vineyards and from the other vineyards. We can compare exactly. And in both cases, the whole bunch was about 0.7 or 0.8 degrees alcohol lower when it finished fermenting than uh, the other barrel. And complicated reasons for that. First of all, you're bringing into the fermentation stems, which have got uh, sap in them that is liquid but not sweet. Secondly, you're taking out, when you throw away the stems, they've got alcohol in them. So you're removing alcohol. The stems and the skins contain alcohol. You press and you throw away. So you're removing more of the alcohol by throwing a fraction away that's keeping some of the alcohol in it. So you, that, those are the two reasons I think you end up with lower alcohol. And I think that uh, if you're trying to make a more delicate, more fragrant style, Having a 15 degree style is a little bit too much. So the Genou this year, I'm, I'm really happy. With it. it's, it's, it's delicate, it's lighter than normal. We put it into a spankingly expensive um, new barrel. Um, one of Sega Moreau's kind of top level barrels are called Icon. We thought let's go for it this year and buy an Icon barrel and put this wine into it because we thought it was capable of being really lovely. And um, uh, yeah, I think it's, it's some, some sl slightly reminds me Ed of, of, uh, of Rioja from uh, Rioja Alta area. So yeah. Slightly, it's more like Rioja Alta, the, the, yeah. the winery La Rioja Alta. So, um, yeah, I'm very pleased with that. I think it's also, all of these wines had about three months longer barrel aging than they normally would. And that was that was because of coronavirus. Uh, we had our bottling plan for March and it was cancelled. Um, the bottling truck said they couldn't come. Uh, everything was on lockdown. So we rescheduled it. We eventually did it in early June. So, yeah, it's kind of two, two and a half months later than, than originally planned. So things stayed in barrel for that time until two weeks before we bottled them when we blended and, um, and bottled. Um, 
I actually think it's done these wines a favour. They're a little bit more open at this stage than they would be if they'd been in barrel only for 12 or 13 or 14 months. Um, but I think that, that makes them more drinkable now and less need for long ageing in bottle. Um, so I think this is, you know, tasting already tasting delicious. And, and yeah, awesome. drink it now. Mm. <laughs> well, drink it, yeah. I mean, it, it'll last... Uh, It'll last four or five years quite happily, maybe longer. We've got some, in fact, we're doing it. This is a, not intended as any advertising because it's already full. Um, the next tasting in two weeks' time is, is a Leisure New Vertical where we've got, I don't know how far we'll go back. It depends how many bottles I can find in my cellar. But um, uh, we started in 2009, but we're going to do 11, 13, 15, and 17 Leisure New. Um, and uh, yeah, it'd be quite interesting to see. Actually, we should do the 18 as well when that's arrived. Well, we may do that. Anyway, Can you stick to this style, Justin. Will you? Will you? Do you like that? You obviously like this fresher, slightly lower alcohol. Um, I think, yes, I love it. I love it, and I, I find myself drinking it um, more, uh, less sparingly. With the domain to be, you have to be a little bit careful because it is a big wine, and if you, you know, if you knock back a, a bottle of that of an evening, you certainly know about it. Um, somehow, Legendre is a bit easier to drink. Uh, in slightly larger quantities not that i'm recommending that course of action <laughs> obviously but um what's been interesting is that if i sh we, we show our wine a lot to um uh we do a, a few food fairs and a few wine fairs uh and we show them to you know expert palates and also people who are ordinary folk who just consume wine who enjoy drinking and there's quite a division and people who actually really prefer domain of the bee and find the genou, genou is a bit thinner and a bit you know the, the people of the more is more philosophy if you pay more money, you want more colour, more flavour, more oak, more generally preferred domain of the bee. But a lot of people who love delicacy and love elegance and stuff that unfolds slowly over time absolutely go for Le Genou. And so I'm sort of trying to keep the two styles separate and, and produce the more delicate style for the perhaps the person who likes the, the complexity and the, and the subtlety perhaps of, of Le Genou. I don't know, what do you all think? Hands up of the two wines, Domain of the Bee and Le Genou, hands up who definitely prefers Domain of the Bee. So on this group, one or two, I think, uh, only. So um, definitely, uh, so who obviously then definitely prefers Le Genou? And then maybe some of you, okay, a few of you may be a bit more uh, in the middle. Uh, I think, but mostly, definitely, mostly we're going for Le Genou. Well, great. Um, I'm, I'm very pleased with that. I'm, I'm, I'm quite excited about doing the vertical tasting as well, so I can track it over time. Um, my friend Patrick, who's not on this call, he came out to France in 2010 or 11, and he actually we weren't there. Um, and my friend Richard showed him around the winery. And Patrick was the guy who got me into wine in the first place. It's his fault. Um, he suggested I worked on the International Wine Challenge many years ago. Um, and I did, and I sort of fell in love with wine, and it's been wine ever since. Um, and he went along to the winery, he tasted through the barrels, and when he tasted the barrel that became the first vintage of Le Genou, he said, this is really, 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 really good. Um, there's a wine in the Roussillon called Le Petit Sibéry, which means Little Siberia, because the vineyard is white soil, unusually in our region. It's really, really chalky. We have very little chalk in the region, and this particular vineyard is very chalky, so it's called Little Siberia. Um, and it produces a wine that's 200 euros a bottle. And Patrick's view was that our Le Genou was capable of being a similar quality level to Petit Sibéry. I think his view was 200 euros a bottle was too much for Petit Sibéry, but he thought our wine was really <laughs> close to being as good. And that was what encouraged me to bottle that first barrel, um, just to see if, if it stood alone from the domain of the bee. In fact, Amanda and Sam came out for that bottling and it was very, very uh, homemade because we put a siphon hose into the barrel and sucked on the siphon hose and literally poured <laughs> bottle by bottle by squeezing the hose, putting it to the next bottle, unsqueezing it. Um, that's how we bottled 267 bottles of the first vintage of Le Genou, which I have nine left in my cellar. Um, and we've only made it subsequently in the years where we think it's good enough. So sometimes we, are, we either don't have enough Grenache or we don't think the Grenache is good enough to make Le Genou. So it's been made in 9, 10, 11, 13, 15, 17, 18. And I think will be 19 as well, judging by what we have in barrel. I think it's, it's again, a lighter, um, lower alcohol style in 19. We have one barrel at 12 and a half degrees, which is incredibly light, but it's really racy and elegant and, and fresh. So we'll, you know, we'll see if it makes a good Le Genou. And these decisions get made, you know, a year after the vintage, every time I, you, 
you don't taste every time you go, but um, you know, every three months or so, you taste through the range of barrels to see how they're getting on and start forming opinions about what wines you're going to make. And then the kind of final selection is normally sort of November, December. I'll do a trip there and spend a long time tasting and then tasting with Jean-Marc and getting his opinion. And then we'll make the final selection of what we're going to bottle in. Usually we'll end up blending in February, bottling in March would be typical. Um, and this year, as I say, that was all pushed back till, 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 till May, April, May and June. So I think we kind of run through the, you know, formal content. We've got a, a little while left, well, a couple of minutes left before eight o'clock, but I think we can probably uh, finish on, on the dot, unless, you know, we, anyone who's got questions is extremely welcome to ask them. And if questions go on a bit longer and you want to drift off, then totally feel free to do so. But it's been a real pleasure being able to taste this wine with you all and be able to see you all on the same screen as well. The last couple of done, we've done, we've had two screens on Zoom and it's quite hard to see what everyone's up to, but you've all been admirably not falling asleep <laughs> as far as I can tell. And um, I hope you've had a nice, uh, a nice evening in exploring these wines a little bit. Um, and it's been a pleasure. Has anyone got any questions? Or comments. Or comments, observations. What would you like to see us do next? Mm. Uh, look at the new vertical. <laughs> well, you, I think, Todd, are booked in for that. Um, we have made that wine club members only. Um, one of the joys of being a wine club member is you do get a discount on all the wine. And many of you know this already because you are. Um, and you do get some wines that are accessible only to you because they're rare because we've about to finish them or they're special bottlings that we release first to wine club members. And you do get the odd event. So we've, you know, we've done a wine club members harvesting weekend. And we do quite a few dinners. Bring a bottle dinner is usually really good fun. Um, so definitely reasons above the, the, the discount to join the wine club. Um, but yeah, the Lejeune tasting is one of them and we are keeping it small. And, and we may, if I've got enough baby bottles, I will add a couple of wines. We say we do four, but we might do five or six wines this time um, just to really give the full spectrum of, uh, of Lejeune. Um, so I don't know, if we, get, if we get a load of people who are wine club members wanting to do it, we could add another... You know, it's another 14 people. A bottle divides into 14 little baby bottles. Uh, a 50 mil, but we overfill them a bit to make them seal properly. Uh, so yeah, if we had, if we had a, lot, a lot of people saying, I really, really want to do it, then we could potentially open it up to a bigger group. But um, so message me if you're really keen and you and it, it's currently sold out. Um, but uh, anyway, we'll also do, I think we're going to do an English sparkling wine tasting sometime in the autumn, um, probably with some other people's wine as well as ours. Um, which I think could be could be fun. How are you going to do samples? Yeah, no, that's a good point. Yeah, no, I had uh, <laughs> I had thought about that, but we might have to do that uh, uh, when we're allowed to do it in person. Ah. Um, and then we've got you know, other older vintages. We've got a few rare ones like our old barrel carrion, a single barrel carignan, which I've got a few bottles left of. We might do a kind of old and obscure bottles that I've got left in the cellar tasting. We might do an orange wine tasting as well. Uh, hands up, who'd like to do the orange wine tasting? <laughs> Maybe. Some, yeah, okay, some of these. That's Is good. good? <laughs> uh, Bob, I really like it. Uh, yeah, I'm sure you've done a good job, Justin. <clears throat> it's, it's, a it's, it's a funny product. It's a funny, strange concept, but uh, it is up and down. Yeah, well, our, Ed, our, our, our take on orange wine is that, you know, a lot of people who make orange wine are, are natural winemakers who use very little sulfur. And therefore, the wines that come out are, first of all, they're made from white grapes, but they're made like a red wine. So you've got tannin in them. Secondly, they're often oxidized because they use no sulfur yeah. deliberately. And they're also often um, containing various things that live in and grow in your wine, which if you're a natural winemaker, you like. If you're a purist uh, technical winemaker, you really don't like. Now, our orange wine is just maceration. There's, we use some sulfur, so it's not oxidized. And we don't encourage um, use some bacteria that shouldn't be there to grow. So it's clean and it's not oxidized, but it's a skin maceration Grenache green. Yeah. And um, yeah, do, do, do taste it. Did you order a bottle, Ed? I can't remember. Well, I, I'm not a member, so um, oh. we'll, have, we'll have to have a, a conversation. Uh, we will, we will. Uh, One will, we will achieve, we'll get you to taste them. It it's a great label. Well, it's quite, it, it's quite, quite psychedelic. I couldn't decide, because we make it from pink coloured grapes. I couldn't decide if it was an orange wine or a, or a pink wine. So I, I said to, to Neil Tully, who did the label, I said, can we just have a sort of psychedelic swirl of orange and pink? And he's done a good job. And yeah, yeah that's what we ended up with yeah great tasting thank you well thank you thank you all for attentively listening and um uh, really feedback would be really really appreciated if you think we should have more in the bottle uh because you just don't have enough and you want to share it 
uh, we've been exploring some 100 mil pouches that um, I don't know if anyone knows. I work with the Bib Wine Company, a bag in box uh, a producer who, who makes lovely wine, expensive wine, and puts them in small bijou bags in box. They've got these beautiful little pouches that are 100 mils. And I did a tasting with them last week, and I was talking to Ollie, and they're thinking about uh, setting up to produce them on a, on a not a commercial scale, but actually sort of charge out, out the service of filling these pouches for other people because these online tastings are really taking off. And pouches are not glass, and they don't. There's no danger of breakage or leaking. So a lot of people are asking them, "Can we can we put our wine in your pouches?" So um, if they do that, I may well use them. Quite apart from the fact that Amanda and I and Sam sometimes spend all all, all the weekend filling up baby bottles and writing out labels and sticking them on, and um, it's you know it's fun, but it's you know if if we if we have fifty or sixty people to cater for, it's, it's a, you know it's a whole weekend's work. It's a weekend. Um, obviously, we love doing it, but uh, man's got a real job to do. So, uh, <laughs> on that side, it stick, gets a bit sticky. That's <laughs> handy. But let's leave it there. I think we're five minutes over. Um, thanks all so much for your participation, and I uh, really appreciate your company. Join us again next time, and uh, in the meantime, happy drinking, and we'll see you all soon. Thank, Thank you. Thanks, Justin. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye.